Our last speaker, Saurabh uh, Songkusare from University of Cambridge. Uh, yeah, he will give a talk. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning. It's great to see such good turnout, even on the last day after the club night shenanigans. Um, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, most of my work involves some DBS and intracranial EEG, and this is the work, the recent work that we've been trying to do with task-induced dynamics. So, uh, first of all, I have no disclosures. Uh, just to mention some preliminary uh, information about this deep brain stimulation. Uh, this is a therapeutic technique in patients with mostly Parkinson's disease, where you put electrodes in the brain in certain parts, such as the subthalamic nuclei, and you have uh, uh, electrical discharges, electrical stimulator, which is implanted in the chest. Now, while they do the surgery and the stimulation is turned on later on, during the perioperative procedure, you can record from these different contacts of the electrodes, and that gives a nice window into getting neuronal population signals. So, and the advantages of this direct neuronal recordings is that it has a very high signal to noise ratio because it is not affected too much by the, the noise uh, movements and other things. Also has a very high spatial and temporal resolution because we are recording at the, from the neuronal population level activity on a meso scale. Uh, having successfully done this DBS and a lot of Parkinson's disease, People have advocated deep brain stimulation for psychiatric illnesses, mostly depression, anxiety, OCD. And this study takes advantage and leverages a clinical trial where we put electrodes in a certain part of the brain called the bed nucleus of stria terminalis, and I'll give some background for it in a moment. But just to emphasize what this major depression is, it's one of the leading causes of the global disability, and it's often correlated and has comorbidity with anxiety symptoms, but sometimes there's a bidirectional relationship between anxiety and depression. Uh, there's a treatment resistant to this uh, when we try this deep brain stimulation in these patients. So that's pretty much the last alternative. That's why we do try to do this. And because there's an urgent need for this novel therapies. For major depression, there's lots of targets which have been advocated. There are lots of acronyms on this slide, but don't worry about them. There's uh, important ones will be the subgenual anti-singulate, BNSD, some fiber tracks as well. Uh, and these uh, deep brain stimulation, the idea behind it is stimulate at a higher frequency, which inhibits some of the activity of these regions. Um, and because of these regions are, have a downstream, upstream, excitatory inhibitory effects on the dorsal raphe nucleus, shown in pink here. They decrease the production of uh, serotonin in these diseases, and this deep brain stimulation corrects that. Right, so we tried to target this brain, uh, bed nucleus of stria terminalis, which is an extended amygdala region. It's heavily involved in emotion, fear, anxiety, stress-induced behavior, and upcoming role is also known for a social emotional function, especially empathy and maternal behavior. As the previous speaker just uh, laid down the foundations for hypothalamus, this structure is just adjacent to the hypothalamus with very high connectivity to it, but, and also to the limbic circuitry. Interestingly, it also has the highest serotonic projections and also the oxytocin receptors. And so in this study, we had a cohort of 23 patients of which 19 participants completed the task, which I'll go through in a moment. Um, the clinical rating scales used for depression and anxiety were the traditional Montgomery Asperger depression and the Hamilton anxiety depression. Uh, Deep brain stimulation and electrodes were the Chinese company Scenery, which had more than four uh, contacts on these electrodes, and we had a post-operative 
CT and MRI scanning to localize these electrodes. So going into the task paradigm, we tested two tasks. One was the empathy for pain paradigm, where you show these painful, non-painful and painful everyday scenarios. There are 45 trials in each condition. And this has been validated before in previous studies uh, and showing activations in quite a few regions, but also most specifically insular. And the other task is the traditional affect task, which uses pictures from the International Affective Picture System, which are categorized into positive, negative, and neutral stimuli. So we had 45 trials in each condition. Uh, here, I'm only talking about positive and negative conditions. At the end of these uh, trials, participants randomly rated five to 10 images for the valence ratings or the painful and non-painful ratings. This is the localization of these electrodes in the structure called BNST, so bed nucleus of stria terminalis, shown in blue here. And the region in the teal color is the hypothalamus, just highlighting how close it is to the hypothalamus. And this is done with the CT and MRI co-registration using the lead TVS toolbox and brain shift correction uh, that is usually applied for these. And you take only the contacts which are specifically in this bed nucleus of stria terminalis, uh, which are closest and definitely in their BNST for further analysis. Right, so first results. So in the empathy for pain paradigm, we first tested if the behavioral ratings of these different conditions, painful and non-painful, is as expected as we would find. And yes, the participant rated the painful conditions as more painful and the other one as less painful. The next plot is the signal recordings, and then you can do time frequency decomposition on the signals that you have. So basically, on the x-axis here is the time, the event-related time, so two seconds, and on the y-axis is the frequency, so from two to traditional 30 hertz, which is obviously divided into uh, theta, alpha, beta, and some gamma activity. Once we have these time frequency maps, you can use some permutation-based testing to find the cluster differences between the two conditions. And here we find this outline in black cluster, black outline, which is the cluster which come out to be significant between the two conditions. So here we find two, condi two frequency ranges, which is the alpha, which is greater in painful condition, and a theta activity, which is also greater. And interestingly, this is just the statistical test from the FDR corrections showing the same mean activity from those two clusters. And interestingly, these two uh, mean activity from these two frequency clusters correlate highly with their depression and anxiety symptoms. So on the x-axis is the anxiety score and the alpha activity, and here is the depression score. But only alpha activity correlates with the depression and anxiety, but the, the theta activity does not correlate with the depression and anxiety. The results for the affect picture paradigm, we followed the similar pattern. In the behavior ratings, we found exactly what we expected. The ratings were consistent, and the time frequency decomposition showed only differences in the early theta activity. And this is really early theta activity, so just at the start of the stimuli. Now, this is very interesting because I've done some analysis on the amygdala as well, and the amygdala shows exactly the same kind of frequency activity uh, that early into the presentation. Right, so this theta, again, is also correlated with their depression and anxiety symptoms. Just highlighting the fact that uh, some tasks can be used for this depression and anxiety correlation. So with that, I'd like to just conclude the study. So here, it's in a unique study where we can get direct high fidelity signals from this small region of structure called bed nucleus of stria terminalis. You quantify the spectral dynamics and you find uh, specific activations. And it is important, and it fills the gap from the fMRI literature because these traditional paradigms have been used in uh, various tasks in fMRI, but the activations have not been reported too much from BNST. 
So it goes a lot in validation from these spectral dynamics. There's condition differences in the theta and the alpha frequency range. And importantly, different TARs showed different frequency clusters, which related to their symptom severity. And what is useful in the clinical domain is that these uh, frequency cluster differences can be used for diagnostic and treatment monitoring biomarkers while we're monitoring them with the DBS recordings. So with that, I'd like to conclude and acknowledge uh, my supervisor, Valerie Woon, and the tremendous team in China who collected all this data and acknowledge the fundings from the Chinese uh, funding agencies. So thank you for listening. Thank you for talking. <laughs> um, we have time for one question um, from the audience uh, wanting to know how you confirmed uh, the valence of the pictures. Someone doesn't like flowers and don't think it was a very positive picture, picture of a flower you showed. Sorry? How did you, how did you validate the valence of right. your picture stimuli? Right. Why is so the flower so positive? <laughs> uh, well, because the International Affective Picture System has been validated for valence and arousal ratings from 3,000 people. So we know from a big sample size data that they have positive and negative valence ratings. That is a very clear answer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, one last round of applause for our speakers. And before we all run away and grab lunch, I would like to make use of that opportunity to also thank the person who made it possible that we actually all ended up in this room and in so many other rooms and listened to so many super nice talks. A big round of applause to our program chair, Dr. Stephanie Forkel, please. <laughs>